A few months back, I covered the top 10 best looking Kickstarter games that sadly never got funded. And due to the popularity of that video, I've decided to do the video that pretty much every other person in the comments section suggested I do next. Failed Kickstarters that did get funded. Right, okay, so to start my journey off, I thought the infamous Mighty Number no. 9 with its constant delays and eventual under par release would be a good place to start. But oh no, compared to what I talk about on this list, that game can pretty much be rivalled with Mega Man 2 in regards to quality. Mainly because, well, it actually got released. You see, pretty much everything on this list not only exceeded the funding needed to make the project a reality, but actually took the combined total of $709,486 from 14,773 backers. Yes, I did the math. And well, they either never finished the game, went bankrupt, or just disappeared, running away with the money, leaving all those backers empty handed. Hey guys, I'm Daniel Wibbertson, and here are 5 video game kickstarters that didn't deliver. Number 1 Multiplayer survival games are pretty big business, if you get them done right. And The Stomping Land, a game that involves you trying to survive in a dinosaur filled land, is an exciting concept. The Kickstarter campaign video looked great and managed to raise $114,060 from 4,427 backers of a tiny $20,000 goal. That's almost six times the amount requested. How the hell did they fuck this one up? Well, turns out since the game was funded on June 6th, 2013, updates were frequent, constantly telling backers a few times a month in most instances what was going on with the project. And on May 30th, 2014, early access keys made their way into the hands of all of the backers that pledged the reward to get them. The game was being talked about on Steam community pages and the game subreddit. Everything was fine. Then, nothing. Everything stopped, with the website, Twitter page and Facebook page all disappearing, leaving nothing but a long list of angry commenters on the Kickstarter page. Even modeler Vlad Konstantinov never got a reply from lead guy Alex Fandora saying that he didn't even get paid for his latest work, and no messages were replied to, so he had no choice but to sell what he had done to pay his team for the work that they have done. That's it. I wish I had more to tell you, but it looks obvious that this, at least by the time the alpha was released, was a scam. Alex not only grabbed the remaining money and ran away, but also put the unfinished game back on sale on Steam Greenlight, with his final ever post being, it has had a year of progress and will continue to undergo production, with frequent updates until the end of 2015. And that is it. Number 2 For anyone out there that has watched the previous Kickstarter video, you'll know I'm a bit of a board and card gamer outside of video gaming and YouTubing. Which is why I'm happy as hell to not have known about Zico. If I knew about the Kickstarter, I would have backed it. However, at least 973 backers did know about it, as it was able to beat the $250,000 goal by raising $257,870. For those that don't know, Zico was originally a board and card game that was marketed as Pokemon with a Purpose. The campaign video is actually quite heartwarming, explaining how Amy Tucker made the game to raise awareness of endangered animals and thankfully, for a while at least, actually succeeded. It ended up getting interest from major American chains and coffee shops before the recession happened, which resulted in almost all of those connections pulling out. If you go over to BoardGameGeek.com, an absolute must of a site for any tabletop fans, the people that did actually play that original card game seemed to quite enjoy it, and the feedback was great, a truly brilliant card experience for all the family. Sadly, even though the game was a critical success due to a lot of the major partners pulling out, the company went under. The Kickstarter campaign was Amy's chance to bring Zico back from the brink. The game had amazing artwork and a great team behind it, and even had legends such as Mike Williams and Nolan Bushnell working on it. Yes, 
the Nolan Bushnell, the guy who is known to many as the father of video games, being the guy who started Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. These guys will actually be helping create the game. Anyway, funding was successful a mere 12 hours before cutoff point, and that's when updates started to slow down. Sure, you had the standard survey and thanks to all involved, including a special thanks to Michael Williams, Zico's biggest fan, who I can only assume is the guy that put down 10,000 to help the project. But then six months passed before any kind of an update. Then another two months after that, not updating the game's progress, but instead just saying that rewards are still being worked on before being shipped out. Another month passes with an update that explains that there have been a number of issues that we've had to address and we assure you the rewards will be coming. Many thanks for your patience. That was on June the 10th 2013, three months after the estimated delivery date. And that's it, until you look in the comments section. On December 14th and December 17th, 2013, Zico posted a comment explaining that the company creating the game called Umba, the company that created the campaign called Wabba, and game designer Amy Tucker couldn't reach an agreement and boom, Wabba went bankrupt. It was explained that a lawsuit by one of the previous directors of Harry Entertainment was put in place. Another company that had previously purchased Zico when it was a card game for $80,000 plus another 100,000 still to pay to complete the purchase. And no one knows, apart from the people making the game, where the rest of the money went. But don't feel bad, according to the game's creator, that $257,870 actually came from friends and family of the members of their company. And the number of Zico players able to willingly support the project was actually less than 40 people. So uh, let me get this straight. You managed to get at least 933 family and friends to back a project that less than 40 people were interested in? If that is true, which it surely can't be, that's one member of the family that's definitely getting knocked off the Christmas list. Number three. The fall of Nemesis Clash of the Cajun, or KCO1 as it was thankfully abbreviated, is the final word in giant monster battle games. It takes the core team and technology from Pipeworks Atari Godzilla fighting games and merges them with the design input and creative output of our amazing fans. Yep, sign me up. I didn't know about this game when it was live, thankfully. But after looking at the campaign video, which claims that this will be the ultimate monster fighting game with direct input from the fans, well, it would have been right up my street. However, what have we learned from videos like this? Never back games that show no real game footage. And this game only showed one tiny bit of animation. Hell, nice artwork though, am I right? Either way, 1,247 backers did help fund the project's goal of $100,000 and even exceeded it by getting the project up to $112,513. And who knows how much was put towards the project using the PayPal donation option. Officially, the game is not cancelled according to the developer, who actually posted a reply to forum backers as recently as the 23rd of November this year. However, the game's progress is suspended. That means the company is no longer actively doing development on the game. Apparently money was not the issue, but instead it was the unexpected death of environment artist Ron Claiborne that halted what was several months of good development on the game up to this point. And sadly, it started a ripple of team members not being able to work with an environment artist and no longer are able to work on the project whatsoever. Money was not an issue, and in this instance at least, the main developer, Simon Strange, still responds to the odd comment on the Kickstarter page, and on his Sunstone Game Forum page too. One of the sadder stories on this list, that in my opinion, is doubtful to ever see a proper release. Here's to you Sunstone Games, let's hope you actually do get to continue working on the game. And here's to the 5 backers who pledged $250 a piece, the 50 backers who pledged $500 a piece, and the 2 backers who pledged $5,000 a piece. Ouch. Number 2. 
Number 4 Alex Peak really, really wanted this game to happen. Code Hero, a game that teaches you to make games, was a Kickstarter backed by 7,459 backers spending $170,954 of a $100,000 target. Yep, people were obviously really into the look of the game. And during the campaign, the guys over at Primer Labs were constantly updating the site page with celebration videos of hitting their target, updating fans almost every single day. And then after the Kickstarter ended on February 24th, 2012, the updates, well, they actually continued fairly frequently. Every few months or so, giving those 7,000 odd backers an update as to what was happening. Although those updates were not always great. Just like practically every Kickstarter going, it got delayed from its expected February 2014 release date several times over. This mix with updates becoming more and more infrequent was followed up on March the 4th 2014 over two years after the expected release date showing 22 sixth graders playtesting the game and the text. I'm sad to say that I'm probably not going to be able to update as regular or as often. But even though you may not hear from us as often, we'll still be working on Code Hero and moving forward with development. This was a common theme with this project. The infrequent updates that they did give were 99% of the time letting backers know that the game was getting delayed or to give bad news like fewer updates or that they needed more time, but hardly ever giving any more information or explaining the reasons why. This, as you would expect, left the comments section to become a pretty dark place of nothing but angry backers who had lost their money claiming that they would be asking Kickstarter to get their money back. Money that they were soon to be discovered had completely gone. Peak paid between $4,000 and $5,000 a month for each programmer, of which he claims he had 10 employees. One of which was David Lopez, a game designer from California who quit working at Red Giant Studios to the offer of $55,000 a year. However, this actually equated to every paycheck bouncing and Peak having to pay Lopez $800 from his personal account. David Lopez said in an interview regarding this that I gave him tons of time. I quit my job in the gaming industry to come and help this dude out. A couple of weeks later, he disappears and drops the whole project. Backers had to search far and wide for this information as the final update to them was on April the 4th, 2014. Code Hero, April update, goodbyes and code based soapbox. I suggest going over to the site and checking it out. It's surprising how little is actually explained. And that's a real shame, leaving the comment section being backers updating other backers. In a nutshell, the money run out. And Peak was unable to get outsider funding, asking his team to work for free. Which they didn't. Legal action for the larger contributors have gone forward, but Peak says that they will not get their refunds until after the game is released. That is, if it ever is released. Strangely enough, Code Hero's website actually has reappeared with updates going up and giving you the chance to even pre-order the soundtrack. However, sadly nothing is being done with those 7,459 backers that helped the project get off the ground in the beginning. And the fact that those backers aren't even getting updates really does go to show how little Alex Peake actually cares about his backers. Number 5 This game actually asked for the least, ironically titled Greedmonger. Disappointing 667 people by taking $90,132 of a $30,000 goal. But that's not all, including the PayPal donations they apparently exceeded over $100,000. Who the hell knows exactly how many people and how much was wasted on this project? Well, Jason Appleton probably knows. Hi everyone, this is Jason Appleton, producer and lead designer of Greedmonger. The game was a 3D, free-to-play sandbox MMORPG with a focus on crafting, economics and politics in a world where you can literally do whatever you want. Sounds good, right? Well, I'm sure if you're into that sort of thing it is. Plus, it's probably good for all of those backers that were looking to get land in the game as part of high rewards in an attempt to sell that land for real money when the game eventually came out. 
Ah, good old flippers. He who dares wins. You see, the biggest problem here, and one to keep in mind the most, is that this is not a typical small indie platformer. It's not an RPG, it's not a puzzle game. It's an MMORPG, probably the most expensive and hardest games to ever make. And Electric Crow, a company that has never released a single game to date with limited funds, was the company that was behind it. However, limited funds technically shouldn't be an issue because after the Kickstarter finished and the shitstorm that was Greedmonger started to unfold, Jason actually stated in a video clearing his name that he is in fact a credible guy to take on a project like this. And that he already had enough money to make a server farm even if the Kickstarter failed. Yep. Money was not a problem to Jason, as he was probably the biggest entrepreneur I'd ever seen. Just looking down the guy's personal Facebook shows him doing more jobs than all of his backers combined. There's his web design work, his mortgage consultancy work, club promoting, voiceover work, DJ competitions, jiu-jitsu competitions, and his very own marketing SEO company. Yep, Jason is not ashamed to... <laughs> get his hands dirty. So one and done is if we are with a couple, then once it happens once, that's it. It's not gonna happen again. Looking at it, you'd think he's the sort of guy to very much get the job done. Well, except for finishing Greedmonger that is. After scrolling back for a couple of years, I couldn't find anything related to the game whatsoever. Now, that's enough about Jason. James Proctor, the lead programmer, wasn't any better, and in the Unity forums, Unity being the game engine that they were going to be using to make the game, he was starting new projects every five minutes, none of which ever got completed. As much as James thought he was probably the world's greatest coder, he was far, far from it. Greedmonger was an MMORPG with hardly anything made from scratch, and instead, the majority of that Kickstarter money was going on store-bought, already-made assets to literally just paste into James's bare-bone world. Eventually, a build of the game was shown three years after the Kickstarter campaign ended, and as expected, it was awful. Problems continued when James quit after three years of being on the project and went on to explain how working with Jason was abysmal. Apparently the deal was that he would not be getting paid until completion and then he would be getting a cut of the profits. Because of this, James played the sympathy card, explaining that he couldn't continue to afford the long hours spent on the game and tried to leave on at least one occasion beforehand, but couldn't do so because he was being threatened to be sued by Jason if he did. Keep in mind, no contract was signed between the two and all they had was their Skype conversations. Now the story gets even stranger when you find out that James was actually disabled with depression and couldn't leave his house. The depression was so severe that he would get panic attacks if he saw large crowds. And this was how he was able to get by making the game on absolutely no salary at all. He was getting disability allowance, meaning that that $100,000 at least spent on the game was going on other people's hard work, buying off the shelf Unity assets, and the creation of the game was being funded by the taxpayer. Anyway, like I said, James, the sole developer of the game, quit. Jason left the project, presumably taking the remaining Kickstarter money with him, and now he's gone silent. Not even going by Kickstarter's own rules of explaining where the money actually went. And what we have left is a lot of pissed off backers with nothing to show for the crazy amount of money that was spent on the project. The website's gone and almost all talk of the game other than the understandably upset backers in the comments section of the campaign has become non-existent. That is other than a random update from James from time to time, who still has a quick go on building the game in between other projects, adding even more Unity store-bought assets, and let's face it, never ever being able to finish it. Hey there guys, whether you're watching this on Larry Bundy Jr's channel or My Slopes Game Room channel, thanks very much for watching. Click the links on the screen or in the description to check out either of our channels and Patreon pages. But for now, that's it from me. This is DJ Slopes signing out and hopefully I'll see you all next time.